The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to The David Pakman Show. A lot of stuff to talk about today. I want to say hi to everyone on the YouTube live stream. Day two, it's up and running. And of course, hi. Also joining us, everybody from the Facebook page, We Survived Bush. You will survive Obama. Welcome to everybody coming over from there. Uh, great stuff happening on that page, Lewis. I highly recommend it. Yes, as do I. Thank you. Please send in your T-shirt pictures of you wearing your David Pakman Show shirts. We've got a bunch in. We're going to do something with them soon. I don't know what, but please keep those in uh, coming in. Lewis wearing his blue David Pakman Show T-shirt today. Of course, those are available. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Freshly laundered, it looks like, Lewis. Yes. Thank indeed. you. Much appreciated. Yep. Also, a few days ago, we had this picture sent in by the Eggman. If you're not familiar with the Eggman, he is an individual who leaves us voicemails regularly. We uh, had a picture of him when he was in prison. We don't know why he was in prison. And we had to determine who he was. Now, Lewis and I guessed that he was gentleman number three in from the left. Natan guessing that he was gentleman number two in from the left. We found out who it is. And the Eggman is indeed the individual that you and I, Lewis, did not think was the Eggman. It is number two. It is the one that, that Natan, or Guatam, as he is known by many, um, uh, said he is. So interesting stuff. That's the Eggman. So we got to the bottom of that. I, I like putting a face to the name. He still didn't tell me why it was, though, that he did some prison time. I still don't know. I, I would really like to know. What do, you, what do you think it is? Well, I mean, if I had to just throw something out there, I'd say it was related to marijuana somehow. I could be wrong. Okay. Let's talk about Brian Fisher. You may be familiar with anti-gay nut Brian Fisher. He's been a guest on the show many times. He said things like the rectal wall is only one cell thick and uh, lesbians don't have uh, children, but at the same time have tons of abortions. It's a really weird thing that he had to say. He had a lot of stuff to say. Well, now he is saying that Todd Akin, Todd Akin, of course, the congressman, Senate candidate who said, if there's a legitimate rape, the body has a way of shutting down the whole thing and you don't get pregnant. <laughs> well, after he said, it's funny how we say that in passing now. Like, that's just, remember that time when that guy said that if it's a legitimate rape, the body shuts the whole thing down? We, it's just, it's kind of part of the conversation now. Right. It's kind of weird. In any case, Brian Fisher saying, it's Todd Akin who's being treated like a rape victim by everybody because of what he said. I know it doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what he said. Let's get a listen to Brian Fisher. See if we can make heads or tails out of this. Dennis Prager wants him out. Charles Krauthammer wants him out. Hugh Hewitt wants him out. Ann Coulter wants him out. The National uh, Review Editorial Board wants him out. The Wall Street Journal Editorial Board wants him out. The Tea Party Express wants him out. So virtually nobody other than the Family Research Council and uh, yours truly, even Rush, apparently now, is out saying that he ought to step aside. So everybody is gang tackling uh, Todd Akin. Now, you talk about a um, forcible uh, situation. You talk about somebody being a victim of kind of forcible assault. Uh, that would be Todd Akin. That's so funny because it yet another case, Lewis, where the victims, of course, as always, the real victims in this country of discrimination, of bigotry, so on and so forth, it's the white Christian conservative men. It always is. Todd Akin, listen, all he does is go out there and say that if it's a legitimate rape, if, it's, if it is a true rape, then the body shuts the whole thing down and you don't get pregnant. Poor Todd Akin, he's been treated like a rape victim. You know, I think, I think Brian Fisher is kind of missing the point that what all these people that are asking, all these Republicans that are asking him to step aside want is for a Republican to win because they know he now has no shot. Exactly. Um, but that doesn't matter to Brian Fisher. All that matters is that people who say ridiculous things about women while trying to defend a ridiculous religion uh, are protected. <laughs> this is the same confusion as with the First Amendment, right? People say something offensive. There's a backlash. And they claim they are the victims who are losing their First Amendment privileges because people are offended by their offensive speech. Todd Akin says something completely outrageous. People don't want to hear from him anymore. They don't think he's the type of guy that we should be hearing any kind of advice, commentary, or, or anything from. And now he's the victim. It's almost like he has been raped. He has been raped of his what? I don't even know what. I mean, he tried to, uh, he basically tried to rape the intelligence of everyone in the country when he made his claims. Right. If so, anything, he's like the rapist. Sure. Sure. We'll go with that. 
Okay. That's what I was implying. Remember Stacy Campfield, Tennessee state senator, who's been a guest on this show. He was on this show to talk about Don't Say Gay, the Don't Say Gay bill, which is where you can't even talk about homosexuality existing in Tennessee public schools because apparently it might make children gay. Just hearing about being gay. The same way that once I heard about being tall and I decided, what the hell, I'll be tall. Didn't quite work. No. Didn't work for me. No. Nope. But it's the same type of idea. He was also very concerned about gateway sexual activity, like hand-holding. That can be really, really dangerous. He is now saying that LGBT teen suicide is, quote, the biggest lark out there. Just doesn't exist. Now, most people know, of course, that LGBT teen suicide is an issue. We've, heard, we've seen and heard extensive reporting about it. We know about bullied LGBT youth who do end up tragically taking their lives. This is a problem. We know it's a problem. Stacey Campfield doesn't think so. He was on the Sirius XM show, the Michelangelo Signorelli show. Michelangelo, I had actually met him at Netroots Nation. Very nice guy. Mm -hmm. He's a fan of this show. Yeah. We're a fan of his show. It's symbiotic. It, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Lewis. He uh, interviewed State Senator Stacey Campfield, and he commented about a number of things, and he had this choice quote to say about, uh, about LGBT teen suicides. He says, quote, that bullying thing is the biggest lark out there. There are sexually confused children who could be pushed into a lifestyle that I don't think is appropriate with them, and it's not for the norm for society. And they don't know how they can get back from that. I think a lot of times these young teens and young children, they find it very hard on themselves, and unfortunately some of them commit suicide. So I read this a bunch of times, and if you don't understand it from my one reading, uh, I didn't understand it from 10 readings, okay? But he, he does seem to be saying that it kind of is an issue, but for a different reason. It's because they're being pushed into a lifestyle. Of course, being gay is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle where you are ridiculed and subjected to uh, uh, lack of rights and considered a second-class citizen by many people. But nevertheless, apparently, it's, it's for some reason, even with all that, it's an attractive lifestyle for some people to choose, and that's why they're killing themselves. Yeah, and who is it that's pushing them into this lifestyle? Um... I don't know, Joe Biden? <laughs> Glee, Ken Kenyan the show Glee. Muslim socialist communist presidents? Yeah, uh, Indonesian, Kenyan, Muslim socialist, Native American anarchist presidents obviously also are gay and want children to be gay and they push them into that lifestyle. Is it just a matter of time before Stacey Campfield is caught tapping his toes in an airport, uh, air, an airport men's room? A wide stance debacle, as they may now be known? I really hope so. I really do. I don't actually hope so. I mean, in other words, it's very widely documented that a lot of these extreme right-wing anti-gay nuts are gay. And part of them acting out in this incredibly hateful and, and damaging way is because of how they grew up in an unaccepting society. So I, I, I only, the only thing, I don't hope that this guy is gay or isn't gay. I just hope that eventually he can sort out this rage and anger that has really taken over. I mean, it's almost what he, he it is what he is known for. Well, I think what, what does anyone know of Stacey Campfield as other than that anti-gay nut? Yeah, I think I think he clearly has followers and people who voted for him. So somebody voted for him. Yeah. Well, I think if these people see that if it turns out that he is gay himself and people see that. It might change their opinion of things when they see that he was just acting out in, in anger because of, uh, because of the way he was raised. And You're that, right. Maybe it, that's it the positive. Opinions. Maybe that's, that's the, the one possibility. Of course, we're not saying he's gay. We're just speculating. Uh, Lubbock County, Texas judge Tom Head has some strong feelings about the President Lewis. Specifically, he's threatening to use weapons against Barack Obama. Remember that Virginia Republican Party armed rebellion? They were saying if Obama gets reelected, we're looking at an armed rebellion here. That's, that's just simply what we're looking at. That was, mm -hmm. I think, that was the Monday or Tuesday story, right? Yes. Well, now, Tom Head, who is a judge, said, quote, he's going to try to hand over sovereignty of the United States to the United Nations. And what is going to happen when that happens? I'm thinking the worst. Civil unrest, civil disobedience, civil war, maybe. <laughs> I can't even get through this without laughing because it, this is a judge. This isn't just some anti-gay radio host in some kind of backwoods place. This, this is a judge, ladies and gentlemen. We're not just talking a few riots here and demonstrations. We're talking Lexington, Concord, take up arms and get rid of the guy. And he also has spoken to the sheriff about this, in incredibly. The sheriff, I've already asked him. I said, are you going to back me? He said, yeah, I'll back you. Well, I don't want a bunch of rookies back there. I want trained, equipped, seasoned veteran officers to back me. My question is, where's the Secret Service on this? You've got a judge here? recruiting law enforcement officials in Texas for an armed 
removal of President Obama. Mm -hmm. Where's the Secret Service? Where's the FBI investigating? What, what's going on in this country? Well, when you, when you back up and look at it, it's, it's completely ridiculous, right? Yeah. Uh, even, the, even the fact that if they wanted to do this, they could somehow achieve it <laughs> is laughably ridiculous, <laughs> right? Like a bunch of, you know, rednecks from, from Texas with some 22s and, and 9 millimeter pistols are, are going to somehow kill the president and stop... Um, Stop what? A civil war? Yeah, but he wants seasoned veteran officers, which the sheriff is right. going to provide. I'm sure he's going to find uh, the, the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, it would take to in order to take over uh, the country. Well, amidst the controversy, he decided to, to maybe explain some of these comments. So now we have audio and video of County Judge Tom Head, and he's talking about, about this. Let's see if the video and audio makes us think maybe he isn't crazy. I'm open to the idea that the comments have been taken out of, out of, out of context. Okay, let's see. Does that mean I think those very worst things are going to happen? No. And so people think, you know, we're, we're talked about uh, the tax increase to go towards the, the sheriff's office to put... Uh, we're putting uh, <laughs> three more patrol units and cars and officers on the street, two more CID, that's criminal investigation, uh, oh, one boy. more narcotics officer, and then we're going to enhance the the attorneys in the DA's office. Okay, and there's another, I think there's another officer involved in that also. Uh, I'm not saying we're going to take those guys and stand in front of the UN. <laughs> I have to think as as uh, emergency management director, I have to think of the worst case scenario and I use that as an example yesterday. Well, I'm convinced. He seems perfectly sane to me based on that video. Now I'm not worried at all. This guy seems perfectly logical. Could be senility. <laughs> um, did you also hear that he's going to enhance the DAs? Like, what does that even mean? I think you're going to enhance them. If you, like, they're going to get breast augmentations. And like, Natan, is that what he's talking about? That the, the DAs are going to get breast enhancement, or he's going to elevate them so that they can become almost like law enforcement officials of some kind? What does it mean? Or will they be like Judge Dredd? I certainly would prefer them to get breast implants than to have some sort of an army against Obama. Maybe he meant he was going to like armor plate them and turn them into cyborgs that are Like the million dollar man. Right. I wonder whether on his best days this judge can even begin to comprehend how paranoid and completely out of his gourd he sounds. No. When, when you're in that position, you never realize it. Right? Wow. Okay. Maybe you're right. Listen, at the end of this show, the show doesn't actually end. There's a bonus show. Producer Lewis produces it, and he hosts it. You can access that bonus show by being a David Pakman Show member. Just go to davidpakman.com slash membership. Great bonus show today, including stores selling meth candy. Interesting. Has Lewis bought any of it? Stay tuned. Plenty more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Today's new David Pakman Show member of the day is made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Life's just not fair to conservatives. Everywhere you look, liberal bias. Find the best examples at liberalbias.com. Very special hello to Laura Hart. Laura Hart is a new David Pakman Show member. It's fantastic to have her. We couldn't do it without her and all of the other David Pakman Show members. Every member is, is very important. Absolutely. Whether you're a monthly member, a yearly member, whatever the case may be, very, very big thank you to you. You can find out more at davidpackman.com slash membership. Remember how last week or earlier in the week we talked about Rage Against the Machines guitarist Tom Morello smacking down Paul Ryan for saying that Rage Against the Machine is his favorite band for the music, not for the lyrics. And Tom Morello is just completely destroying him, saying, we stand for everything that you don't stand for. And uh, that's it. Please stop talking about Rage Against the Machine, basically. Ba basically, Paul Ryan is, is the machine. <laughs> right. Uh, Paul Ryan is the machine that Rage Against the Machine is raging against, but he seems to like the music, not the lyrics, though. Well, now, uh, this is so funny, Twisted Sister. Twisted Sister has the song, We're Not Gonna Take It. And Dee Snyder found out 
that Paul Ryan was warming up crowds with that song, and he said, please stop using that song. Cease and desist. Cease and desist. He said, I emphatically denounce Paul Ryan's use of my song, We're Not Gonna Take It, as recorded by my band, Twisted Sister. There is almost nothing on which I agree with Paul Ryan, except perhaps the use of P90X. Of course, P90X, the exercise regimen that mm -hmm. Paul Ryan famously said that he uses. Why don't they just pick really good rock and alternative bands that are made up of right-wingers? So just Ted Nugent? Oh, right. There aren't any. That's right. Pretty soon, the only songs Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan will be able to play at their events will be the collected works of Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> Ted Nugent. And Ted Nugent. Yeah, yeah. What else is there? Um, I don't know. I'm sure you could throw some other country singers in the mix there. Other than country music. Yeah. And Hank Williams is country, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And Ted Nugent, it's what? It's kind of Just like... rock. Southern rock. Southern rock, yeah. I guess. I really don't like Ted Nugent's music. I know. Neither do you I. You know I don't like it, or you don't like it either? No, I don't like it. No. Oh. All right. So, no D. Snyder, no Twisted Sister, no Rage Against the Machine, at least, for Paul Ryan. Sad, mm -hmm. yeah. but hilarious. Who knows how many other cease and desist letters he'll get from uh, musicians. <laughs> Hopefully a lot. Yeah. All right, let's get to my interview with Dennis Campbell. We spoke with Dennis just before the start of the show. Let's see what he had to say today. It's Thursday, and joining us for Worldview with Dennis Campbell is Dennis Campbell. He's editor in chief of UK Progressive Magazine, also, of course, author of the new ebook Magic Underwear in the Situation Room Mormon Myths, Weird Faith versus GOP Sexism, Racism, and Lies. Dennis, we had Paul Ryan selected as Mitt Romney's vice presidential running mate recently. I'm curious, what's the reaction in Europe? How does, how does Europe and the UK see a guy like Paul Ryan? Uh, religious, obsessed with Ayn Rand, although he never really said that. He loves Rage Against the Machine, although Rage Against the Machine doesn't really like him. What's the perception of him? <laughs> well, it's very interesting. You know, Ayn, uh, um, Ayn Rand, listen, to Paul Ryan uh, presents a very interesting set of dilemmas because what he does, and, and in preparation for this segment, uh, we were supposed to have done this last week, but of course the uh, Julian Assange thing took over. Um, I talked to a number of political editors, people with whom I've had dealings with over the years, and almost the consensus uh, opinion is is that Ann Ra uh, <laughs> Paul Ryan, uh, I can't seem to get the it's two of them slip, in yeah. my <laughs> in my head. Paul Ryan seems to represent an ideology that competes with the general ideology within the states, and certainly within any ideology you'd find here. And, uh, for example, uh, one of my conversations with Adrian Masters, he's the uh, political director of ITV, and he was talking about the fact that this guy is so ideological that most people here in the UK and the EU can't even get their arms around some of the things that he's been talking about. I mean, we understand the concept of, of, of shrinking government, we understand the concept of austerity, but to propose getting rid of Medicare, welfare, they're, they're so different to the sensibilities of people here in the UK and the EU. Okay, and but now talk about that for a second, because there's some conservatives here in the US, they like to troll our YouTube channel and, cons and, and liberal message boards, etc., who say this idea that everything in the UK is just so liberal and great, there's the Tory party, and the Tory party, conserv some conservatives in the U.S. like to say, are not that different from some of these right-wing Republicans. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, while that may be true when it comes to fiscal issues, the social conservatism taken to the extreme among the American right, that's not the same in the Tory party, is it? Well, a absolutely not, at least at this point. There was an article yesterday in The Guardian that did uh, seem to, to give an indication that some of the very highly conservative, what would be considered the right-wingers in the Tory party are beginning to feel as though they now have the ability to advance an agenda. The problem is, is that, in general, the Tory party is not very strong. They only won the election four years ago, or three years ago, excuse me, by eight votes, eight seats. So the, the minority was required, uh, I'm sorry, the, the majority was required because they managed to convince the Liberal Democrats to come into government with them. So that gave them that cushion that they needed to be able to actually govern. But the problem is, is now you've, 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 you've taken a far left liberal party with the Liberal Democrats and a far right party with the Tories, and they're kind of a natural counterpoint to each other. If the Tory party goes too far, they lose the Liberal Democrats and they lose the ability to govern. There's been a lot of friction and fissures in that relationship over the last couple of years, and it's really coming to a head now. 
Right now, everybody's out on, on uh, summer recess, but they'll be back in about three weeks towards mid-September, and we'll begin to see all of the issues that have been placed on the back burner, the, the, the Rupert Murdoch thing, the, the press freedoms, all of the issues related to cuts to the National Health Service, uh, et cetera, coming back into the forefront of, of our thoughts as the summer holidays end. Okay, so give us a little bit more in the last minute or so we have here. What other opinions are there? What's the reaction to Paul Ryan? Well, Paul Ryan is, is, is unknown, as was Mitt Romney, Romney before the, the prism of the gaffes that we saw when he came to London. Um, you know, it's, we, we tend to see um, the, the prism of, of Republicans as being non-ideological. So the stark differences that we see now between left and right and taking issues such as abortion and making them the number one issue out there in the contest, it's all very new here. And I think that's part of the reason why some of the far right on the Tories seem to think that they can also get away with trying some of the same things here, but they're not likely to get very far. It's almost as if the entire Republican Party has jumped the shark and Ann Ra <laughs> Paul Ryan's selection, <laughs> I tell you, I can't get the two of them separated in my own mind, so I don't know where we're going to go. Paul Ryan represents the significant jumping of that shark because all we've read about him is that he is so ideological, and that's anathema to what we are used to dealing with here in the UK. Yeah, I mean, the way, you know, as Todd Aiken said, uh, if Paul Ryan isn't a legitimate candidate, then the body will just shut the whole thing down. Still remains to be seen, you know, whether that uh, actually happens. Kind of scary, actually. All right, we've been speaking with Dennis Campbell, editor in chief of UK Progressive Magazine. The new ebook, which we'll get into more detail next week, Mag uh, Magic Underwear in the Situation Room Mormon Myths, Weird Faith versus GOP Sexism, Racism, and Lies. Great stuff, as always, Dennis. Thank you. See you next week. Okay, stay tuned. We'll be back with plenty more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Joining me is Brad Friedman, investigative journalist and blogger at bradblog.com. Brad, we haven't been talking that much about voter fraud outside of so-called voter fraud within voter ID, which of course isn't really a problem and won't really be stopped by voter ID laws anyway. But before we talk about that, you're all over the voting machines and that side of the voter fraud angle. What do we need to be looking at for the 2012 election? Where are the areas of concern? Take it from there. Well, for the most part, you need to get the word voter fraud out of your vocabulary. Uh, and, and we're talking about both the, the front end voter suppression stuff that you're seeing with these photo ID restrictions, as well as the back end stuff with the voting machines and whether your vote will actually be counted uh, at all, much less counted accurately and transparently in a way that you can know it has been counted accurately. Uh, so uh, voter fraud is not the uh, concern. The concern is election fraud, insider election fraud, people who have access to the system, whether it be to the vote rolls that, uh, that, that can and are being purged across the country, uh, or to the electronic tabulators at the back end, which uh, within a few seconds and a few keystrokes can flip an entire election. You have to uh, uh, keep your eyes on the things that uh, are difficult to look at. For example, the electronic tabulation of votes. That's frankly impossible to look at. And that's a great concern of mine, because even though we have paper ballots across uh, about two thirds of the country, almost none of those paper ballots are actually counted by human beings. They're counted by machines uh, that are often just wrong. They're just they just fail. They give the you know, they name losers to be the winners in elections uh, or they can be manipulated by insiders. OK, now, with regard to the presidential election and the results, certainly if all of a sudden uh, Mitt Romney wins California, huge red flag, obvious glaring error. So really, I'm guessing that the areas where this could turn the election are going to be focused on swing states. And probably it's even going to be, am I wrong if I say certain counties where for some reason something about those particular counties will make it more nebulous, more difficult to know whether hey, uh, the, a few votes here in this county, a few vote here, all of a sudden you, you swung a swing state. 
Yeah, it's actually not just a few counties. It's pretty much every county in America. And by the way, I wouldn't be so sure, you know, if, if California suddenly goes to Mitt Romney, I wouldn't be so sure that suddenly uh, people uh, determine that something's wrong. Remember, you had a guy, uh, Alvin Green, who nobody who had ever heard of, uh, who didn't do any campaigning, who had no money, who had no website, uh, who was announced the winner of the uh, South Carolina Democratic primary for the U.S. Senate <laughs> back in 2010. And, you know, nobody blinked an eye. They said, well, I, I guess there's a reason that people voted for Alvin Green, who nobody had ever heard of. I suspect if, uh, you know, in a case where Mitt Romney were to win California, what you would see is not people saying, well, how did that happen? What went wrong? Uh, were the votes counted accurately? Instead, you'd say you'd see people saying, well, you know, uh, Mitt Romney is, uh, you know, popular out west because of the Mormons. Uh, you know, they'll find <laughs> reasons to backwards engineer Mitt Romney winning California uh, and, and test, you know, try to figure out what went wrong in their pre-election polls rather than question if the actual results were tabulated correctly. We see this time and time again. We saw it as recently up in uh, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, during the uh, historic uh, gubernatorial recalls up there at the end of the, uh, the, the night, 8 p.m., when the polls closed, uh, all the news networks were telling you that their exit polling taken. It was going to be a long night. Get your popcorn. This thing may go until morning. As a matter of fact, more voters supported uh, Barack Obama in that recall than Mitt Romney by like 11 points. And yet, 30 minutes later, Scott Walker wins in a landslide <laughs> and nobody can explain it. And uh, nobody actually bothered to count any of the ballots cast across the entire state of Wisconsin, even though those paper ballots were tabulated on the very same machines that just two months earlier in Palm Beach County, Florida, actually named several uh, losing candidates to be the winners. The computers named the wrong candidates to be the winners. We only found that out in Florida because uh, the election director down there bothered to actually count some of those paper ballots. Meanwhile, up in Wisconsin, nobody counted any ballots. They simply relied on whatever the computers told them, uh, no matter how strange the result actually seemed when the computers told it to them. If we tie in now the recent voter suppression idea that we're seeing on voter ID, I mean, people being purged from the rolls in Florida and a number of other states, it seems to me that if you want to steal an election, the much more under the radar way to do it is through the technology rather than through removing people from the voter rolls because they're going to make noise. At least some of them are going to try to vote. They're going to be told you're not registered whatever. That is a much easier way to, to make news, I think, than by very quietly manipulating the technology. So I'm curious, in your opinion, why are we seeing this effort on voter ID when you're going to see much more of a public outcry to that, whereas with the technology theft, maybe nobody even knows? Well, <clears throat> first, it's not voter ID. Uh, we need to get that word uh, just out of our vocabulary. All These my vocabulary is wrong today, Brad. I, well, I know, but it's important, actually, because this has been a long con by the Republicans, and they're counting on folks to call it voter ID, which sounds quite reasonable. And in fact, it is quite reasonable. Most states already have uh, voter ID requirements. In fact, every state in the union, uh, by federal law, the Help America Vote Act, requires first-time voters to show voter ID if they don't register in person. Voter ID in and of itself is not a problem. Uh, bank statements, paycheck stubs, driver's license, all sorts of reasonable uh, things to identify yourself. People hear voter ID and they say, yeah, what's wrong with that? In truth, nothing is wrong with that. What is wrong is polling place photo ID restrictions, these very narrowly ta ta tailored state-issued photo ID restrictions. Only certain types of photo IDs uh, are allowable, uh, the types that uh, the Republicans know huge numbers of Democratic-leaning voters simply do not have, uh, the elderly, minority, students, uh, uh, the poor, and so forth. Uh, so. These are photo ID restrictions. That's the concern. As far as your original uh, question, you know, the, these are sort of uh, two sides of the same coin. If you can keep people from being able to cast their legal vote and you can do it 
legally, so to speak, you know, pa by passing these laws, making these uh, requirements that we know will suppress uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of votes. If you can do that legally on the front end, keep people from being able to vote at all uh, legally, it makes a lot more sense than risking uh, uh, gaming the systems on the, the, the voting systems on the back end risking a huge uh, a felony uh, to try to game the system in something that can be traced back to you. So it's, it's really two sides of the same coin. The Republicans are pulling out all the stops this year, uh, and, and frankly, they need to. If they can shave off just a few uh, percentage points, as you said, David, uh, in, in a few key states and in a few key counties in those states, that can be enough to uh, to throw an entire national election they know it problem is i'm not sure if democrats know it and i'm quite certain that the corporate mainstream media doesn't know it they don't have a, a clue about it or if they do they're simply unwilling to talk about it and and let the electorate know about the concerns okay so last thing real quick i want to make sure moving forward i'm using the right wording so what I incorrectly referred to as voter fraud. What's the right way we should be discussing it? What's the right phrase? Bo uh, voter fraud is incredibly rare. That is not really a, a, a great threat to our elections. The real threat to our elections is election fraud, specifically insider election fraud. That's one term. The other term, voter ID, forget about it. The concerns here are polling place photo ID restrictions. Uh, if you want to use a shorter word for it, voter suppression at the polling place. Okay, great. I'm going to adjust my vocabulary moving forward. We've been Thanks. speaking with Brad Friedman, investigative journalist and blogger. The website is bradblog.com. I get his newsletters. Uh, I don't know if daily, but I get everything you send. I think I'm getting, and it's all great stuff. So thanks again, Brad. Thanks, Dave. For all you do, my friend. Appreciate it. Okay, let's take a break. Stay tuned. Plenty more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show is independently funded, mostly by individual memberships. Please consider a membership at davidpakman.com slash membership. Are strippers responsible for this particular DUI death? This is interesting. We don't react as much when the drunk driver is killed in a DUI accident, kind of thinking, well, listen, they're responsible for their own fate. If they died because they were driving drunk, that's one thing. However, when the death is to someone who happens to be on the road at the wrong time, to somebody who is a passenger, who some, somebody who is not directly related to the drinking per se, people seem to feel a lot worse. There's a lot more guilt involved and uh, a, a, lot more, um, a lot more guilt involved, I think it's fair to say. Right. The drunk goes off to jail. The family is, has someone deceased. They're left to grieve. It's a very different situation. Now, there's a lawsuit in Houston that is looking to remedy exactly this type of case. There's a drunk driver, Erasmo Ramirez, who's already in jail, okay? He was convicted of drunk driving and causing the accident, with, which killed Catherine Jones. He drove his car into the back of her truck. He was estimated to be going about 130 miles per hour. His blood alcohol level was an incredible 0.295. Have he you survived. Ever, have you ever even heard of something that high? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, but I, I'm shocked that he, sur he survived a crash at that speed. He did. Now, yeah. Texas state law allows for divided negligence in wrongful death suits. So whoever is 51% or more at fault for the death can be sued. This is where the story takes an interesting turn. Now, Ramirez had been drinking at a club called Rick's Cabaret International, which employs strippers. Now, according to a press release from Rick's Cabaret, those strippers are charged a fee to strip at the club and the club gives credits towards paying that fee for any drinks that the stripper can get customers to purchase and drink. So they apparently followed this plan with Ramirez and only stopped pushing him to buy more and more drinks when he ran out of money. Now the short version is that the club policy is push alcohol. The legal logic is that this means Rick's Cabaret contributed 
to the death of 18-year-old Catherine in this case. Now, it remains to be proven whether in the chain of events the strippers are responsible for more than 51% of the responsibility as required in Texas. That may be difficult. Okay. Yes. Now, look, before you comment, mm -hmm. Ramirez is in jail. He's serving a 15-year sentence. Catherine Jones's family is still grieving. And this is probably happening again in Texas. Someone getting served when they shouldn't be. They're too drunk to drive. They've got enough cash for one more. So I have two thoughts on this. Then I'll let you comment. Because Lewis is a bartender. I'm sure you have uh, insight into this. On the one hand, in Connecticut and Maine, for example, if it can be proven that someone was obviously drunk and was still served, and then either killed or hurt someone, including themselves afterwards, the bar and the bartender can both be criminally and civilly responsible. On the other hand, is it really the business's fault that he didn't have a designated driver? Is it their responsibility that he ended up driving? It seems logical that the club would have a policy to get customers to buy alcohol. I mean, that's where they make money. Ramirez made the choice to consume it and then get into the vehicle. We all make choices like him every day. Two sides. What do you think? I think the, the strippers and the bar have 0% accountability for this. Oh, wait a second, though. As a bartender, you are not allowed to continue serving yes, people that David, are clearly drunk. I, I understand this. And so what, why is it different with a stripper? <laughs> and what does someone do when a bar tells them they can't have any more to drink? They go to a different one where the bartenders might not be aware that they've had anything to drink that night, and it just continues. That's fine, but that's kind of, that, that still doesn't change that that initial bar that doesn't serve him isn't breaking the law, whereas the next bar is. That, that's a key difference. Yes, there's a chance that they are breaking the law. But uh, but if you ask me, are they are they responsible for the death of this girl? I'm saying no. I'm saying that law should not exist. If it does exist, I'm saying they should not uh, be sued. Natan, give me your thoughts on this. On the live chat, we're now on YouTube live chat, 2, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Thursday. People saying, listen, if they didn't force the alcohol down the guy's throat, it is not their fault. This guy had some agency and was able to decide. What do you think, Natan? Yeah, uh, this seems pretty complicated. It seems to me like either you're going to hold the bar or the bartender or maybe like a bouncer that's there to monitor every person that walks out or you're not going to hold them liable at all. It seems very difficult to pick and choose when it makes sense to hold them liable. You're going to have to go on. Let's say the bartender asks the person a question. How many have you had tonight? Because maybe they might not remember. The person might feed them a lie. So, so it's very hard to tell. And how can you tell whether someone's able to drive? Maybe they had seven, but they seem fine. But when they get in the car, they get into a crash. Why should the bartender be held liable for that? I think where this differs from standard bar drinking policies is that part of the concept here is one where in order to pay their stripping fee, the strippers are encouraged to get people to buy as much alcohol as possible. And that, by definition, I feel like is going to cause problems. Whether it should be against the law, that's kind of another question. We'll see yeah. what happens in the lawsuit. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it is going to come down to the laws of the state, um, but uh, I do not think that those laws should exist. All right. 40% of U.S. food is wasted, according to a new report by the Natural Resources Defense Council, saying that about 40% of the food in the U.S. is never eaten. It amounts to about $165 billion a year in waste. The group says more than 20 pounds of food is wasted each month for each of 311 million Americans, amounting to about $1,350 to $2,275 in waste annually for a family of four. Another way of thinking about it is as dumping 80 quarter pound hamburger patties in the garbage every single month or throwing two dozen boxes of breakfast cereal into the trash bin instead of into the pantry. Now, Lewis, you worked at a, a grocery store when yes. we were in high school, and you were alarmed at the amount of food that was just thrown out. Yeah, shocking, shocking amount of food. Uh, personally, I do not waste, uh, I waste as little food as possible. Once in a while, I'll go somewhere for a few days, I'll come back, something will be spoiled in the fridge, I'll have no choice but to throw it out. Generally, I do not do this at all. But when you look at these numbers, uh, it's, it's shocking. The report says that because food is so cheap and it has been plentiful in the U.S., of course, People going to bed hungry is still an issue. Poverty is still an issue. But on the whole, for people who aren't in that situation, it appears to be so cheap, people throw out about 25% of the food and beverages that they buy. Other factors, though. Portion sizes account for significant food loss in restaurants. 17% of food in restaurant, uh, uh, on, in restaurant meals is just not eaten. Because why? Too much food is being served. Right. 
That's another factor. Today's portions can be two to eight times larger than USDA or FDA standard serving sizes. Think about the environmental costs because number one, if you consider the carbon footprint of producing and transporting the food to where it is initially purchased, that's one side. But then there's the back end of it. Think about the additional carbon footprint for the disposal of the food that has been purchased and has never been eaten and then is in the trash. Now you have to ship that food back out to a landfill or wherever it is that it goes. It's on both ends. It's incredible. Yeah, taking up space and uh, landfills are becoming a huge problem, especially in our area. Um, there's just not that much room and no one wants them in their backyard. I mean, eventually, what are you going to do? Absolutely. Let me make one more point on that. I think apart from the environmental cost, just the moral cost of not using the food to feed uh, food shortage issues in this country. As recently as 2010, one in seven households had a food shortage and one third of those were severely uh, short of food. Right. So, it's been, so it's, this is absurd just it, on the face of it. It's day. very clear in this country and in the world we don't actually have a resources problem. We have a resource allocation problem. There's plenty of food. It's just not getting to the right people. Let's go to your voicemails. You can call our voicemail line 24 hours a day, 219-2-DAVID-P. Here is a voicemail about someone actually using the, the talking points I suggested on this show. Let's take a listen. Hey, David. This is Jeremy calling from Chicago, Illinois. In response to your show on the 20th, uh, Stevan, you must be the, I think he said, money idiotic person ever well i don't see how that's constructive criticism as you called it i would just say that stevan is an idiot and you guys are the money i tried your <laughs> thing out today about uh obama and the uh, uh right-wing talking points about how they're bad somehow i have only three conservative friends in chicago they were talking about Obama, how bad he was for the economy, and then I made the fact that the stock market is doing better than ever, corporate profits doing better than ever, and they look dumbfounded. And I said, so, we have no jobs. And I said, there's your proof that trickle down doesn't work. That's it very much. Keep your, uh, keep your show up. We love it. Have a good night. See you. All right. Very good. Time for one more, Lewis? Yeah, we got it. Okay, one more voicemail here on Ayn Rand. Hey, David. I think I figured out the fetish that Paul Ryan and the Republicans have with Ian Rand. Because it's not a philosophy, right? I mean, like, people like uh, Noam Chomsky and, you know, Brother West, they, they don't talk about Ian Rand. I, I studied philosophy. I took as many Ian philosophy. Rand. Part of the reason they don't talk about Ian Rand is because they're probably talking about Ayn Rand. But the case, the case in point, it's still a good, good voicemail. Let's listen. As I could when I was in college. You know, I only went to a community college, but... You know, I took as many as I could. And I, I don't remember anything about Eon Rand. It strikes me more as a book that's kind of like on the lines of the Turner Diary. So, okay. if you really so look this at is a very long voicemail, but uh, making the point here, which I agree with, let me summarize what the point is there. Uh, why on earth are Republicans even talking about Ayn Rand? That's really the point. Why are we even talking about Ayn Rand as, as uh, uh, even questioning whether it's some kind of legitimate philosophy for the society or the economy? I don't get it. Well, there is something there that the, the Republicans can relate to, especially the ones in that top income bracket. They kind of use it as, a, as something to hide behind almost, as if it legitimizes w what they want to do. It makes people, people feel good about rich people being the people you want to listen to, the people that should be in charge, the people that are good people. Because by, according to Ayn Rand, if you've obtained a lot of money, by definition, you're good, you did the right thing, you figured out a way. Case yeah. in point. Right. A few emails on the Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan anagrams to my ultimate Ayn Rand porn segment. There's even the right amount of spaces and is interesting but too deep for a typical bagger most of which probably never heard of Ayn Rand to comprehend. For them, it's all about the color thing and only the color thing. I assume that means uh, President Obama being black. Yeah, probably. Okay. And the only porn without a happy ending. All right, interesting stuff. Keep the voicemails coming. Keep the emails coming. We will see you on Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern, YouTube live stream or the YouTube clips, free speech TV, radio, TV, the podcast. Wherever it is that you watch or listen, thanks. We'll see you next week.
David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.